Man, it was so good. I, I haven't sung that song in years. But just to remember, like what I talked about last week, as we turn our eyes on Jesus and as we focus on him and as we have those times, it, it's weird how the things of the earth are just, they seem more and more meaningless, don't they? The more you focus on the supernatural, the more you focus on God himself, and the more you know him, you realize how trivial everything else appears. It's been another great week for me, um, just studying the Word of God. And uh, one of the things I love about the Bible is I personally, I tend to get distracted. I tend to uh, get off course in life. Um, you know, you're doing real well, and then suddenly you just you start heading in another direction. That's one of the things I love about the Word of God is it, it shows you. It opens your eyes up, and you go, wow, I think I've been heading the wrong direction here. And that's one of the things that God's Word has done for me this week. Um, <clears throat> I finally got one of these things. Uh, GPS. Uh, I, I've been waiting. I keep waiting for the prices to go down, you know, and you go, oh, it's, it's like half of what it used to be. You keep going down, 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 down. And I keep waiting. I always, yeah, I'm just so cheap. And then someone finally just got me one. But, um, but it was, uh, it was one of those things where I would have saved so much money had I gotten this earlier, just in gas and time. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like my, my wife, uh, I guess I can talk about it. Um, Oh, a few weeks ago, she, you know, was coming home from Hollywood, so she jumped on the 5 South. <laughs> we could have really used one of these. She came home with a pinata, and uh, <clears throat> she didn't make it that far, but it was close. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, <laughs> now that I'm in your world, you GPSers, um, you know what I love about this is I love when... Um, I love when you make a wrong turn, it doesn't get mad at you. It just says, recalculating. I love that. I love that. It's like, why didn't you listen to me? No, no, no it doesn't say it. It just goes, recalculating. And, uh, and, and, and it's so assured, you know, and I just want, you know, because she's so nice, I just want to go, thank you. I'm sorry, you know, like... But it's that assuring voice that says, you know what? It, it gives you that confidence. Like it, it's basically saying to me, I don't know what's saying to you, but basically she's saying to me, I'll still get you there. You know, I'll get you there. It'll take a little longer, but I'll get you there. <clears throat> some of you guys have taken some wrong turns in life. We all do it. And, and, and I hope that, that this morning is one of those times where you just hear the Holy Spirit saying, recalculating. I'll still get you there. It's going to take a little longer now, but I'll, I'll still get you there. Um, that's, that's what the Word of God does for us. It gives us a new set of directions. At some point, we've got to listen, though. And so this morning, I, I, you know, for some of you that have gone some wrong directions, and uh, the thing I'm learning more and more about God is His grace and just saying, yeah, you, you, you went the wrong way. But I'm not here to just yell at you and tell you you, you you screwed up. I'm just saying I'm recalculating your life now for you and giving you a new set of directions and saying we can still get there. We can still get there. It doesn't matter what you've done. We can still get there. But now listen to me this time. And so would you guys stand as we read the Word of God? Let me read from 2 Peter chapter 1 as we continue <clears throat> in our study of 2 Peter. In verse 5, it says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, 
For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to uh, really listen to your word today. For those of us who have strayed, maybe have gotten off course a little bit, just pray that we would really believe in the power of your Holy Spirit to change us, to get us back on course. And help us this time, Father, to listen to your word. That we can become those people that you want us to be and that we want to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. (coughs) So in this passage, he says, make every effort. Make every effort. I want you to think in your life right now, as far as making effort, think through what do you work hardest at? Think that through right now. What do you, because this, this word, you know, it's just like bring in all your effort, bring in all your zeal. What do you work hardest at? In this passage, he's talking about these character qualities. And he's saying, you know, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and your virtue with knowledge and your knowledge with self. He names all these things that have to do with who we are. And he says, make every effort toward this. Be diligent toward this. And here's where, like I said, you know, I noticed, wow, I think I've gone off track here. And the Word of God just brought me back this week. Something I've noticed is, okay, 10, 15 years ago, I specifically remember people asking me this question. They would ask me, what are your goals in life? What are your goals in ministry? And I still remember my answer. I thought about it this week. It's the first time I thought, I'm like, wow, I remember how I used to answer that question. I used to tell people, you know what? I don't, and and I was completely sincere. I go, I don't know what my goals are in ministry. I don't know what my goals are in life as far as what I'm going to accomplish or what I even want to accomplish. I go, but I have a very clear vision of the man I want to be one day. I know the type of husband I want to be. I know the type of dad I want to be. And have a very clear picture, especially of the type of Christian that I want to be. I I had in my mind, my goals were wrapped around who I was going to become. This type of person, not what this person was going to achieve. And I was thinking back, wow, that's, that's all I cared about back then. I was focused and I realized something this last year where I've gone astray is I've gotten really focused on what I want to accomplish and what I want to do. And it's not that I've fallen apart, you know, in my character, but I put it on the back burner. There was almost this sense of, well, I'm I'm good enough, you know, I'm doing pretty well in my character. And so I'm going to focus on stuff and what I'm going to do. And that's such a mistake because the truth is, is, is this, this, you know, like that pa- this passage says, it says if these qualities are yours, if these character qualities are yours and they're increasing, that's what keeps you from being ineffective or unproductive. See, when you're the right person, things are going to happen. You're going to produce the fruit. You're not going to be ineffective. Things will happen in your life. And, and it is so true because when I started off, I noticed, man, I had friends that would pursue positions and, and pursue, you know, ach- achieving this, achieving that. I want this. I want that. And they kind of let their character go in the back burner. And it was actually really sad because what happens is they end up with neither. They don't accomplish what they want to accomplish because they weren't the people that they needed to be. And as I look back in life, I, I realize gosh, you know, was it really that I pursued all of this stuff and did I really try to accomplish a bunch of things? Or was it that I just tried to be the man that God wanted me to be and then all this stuff just started happening and all these results that you didn't even strive after. You start, these things just start happening. 
And it was so good for the word of God just to cleanse me again and go, okay, stop trying so hard to fix this, to achieve this, to accomplish that. Just go back to becoming the man that I've called you to be and make every effort towards that. Be diligent towards that. See, some of you need to recalculate your life this morning because maybe you've been too focused on what you want to do rather than on who God's called you to be. That doesn't mean we don't work. <coughs> I've worked all, the, all that time because that's part of having character is not being lazy and having a good work ethic. But this whole idea of pursuing and praying hard and making every effort and bringing all zeal towards these character qualities in your life, it hasn't been number one priority. <clears throat> Some of you came here this morning with a hope that God would change your circumstances and fix your situation. And the first thing I want to say to you is that God is more concerned about changing you than your circumstances. You understand that? It could be that God wants to keep you in these difficult circumstances because he's changing you. See, it's about your character. God loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay where you're at. It's this, it's this new person that he wants to make us as we know him, as I talked about last week. Remember how he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness? Because those are the things that he wants from us. He wants to see his children alive. He wants to see his children godly. He wants to see his children with grace and peace multiplied upon them. And that comes from knowing him. That comes from becoming like him. And so we make every effort towards these things. And then the other stuff will happen. But here's <coughs> the important question is, do you want to change? Is this the desire of your heart this morning? Is, is not, I came here, God, because I want you to fix this, fix that. But you came here going, God, I want you to fix me. I want you to change me. That's what your Holy Spirit came into me to do. See, he starts off the passage. He actually says, for this very reason, make every effort. For this very reason, make every effort towards these things. <coughs> now, now what's, what's this reason? Remember earlier, what, what we studied last week. He talked about how he's given us everything. His divine power has given us everything that pertains to life and God. He's given us everything we need to live these godly lives. We talked about that, right? And, and we talked about how that's in the knowledge of him. It's, it's through knowing him. And then he talks about him, how we became partakers of the divine nature. Right? That, that now I'm not just flesh and blood. I'm not just this human being. But when I gave my life to the Lord, when I decide to follow Him, when I decide I don't want to live that way anymore, I want to live the way you want me to live, at that moment He puts His Holy Spirit into me. And so now I'm a partaker of this divine nature. And as it says, that, that I, I've escaped the corruption of the sinful desires here on this earth. Like I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not just going down this whirlpool like everyone else getting sucked in deeper and deeper and deeper. Deeper. But no, I've been given this divine nature and now I can live a different way. And now he says, for this reason, because you have this Holy Spirit in you, because you have been given this divine nature, because God's blessed you and given you everything you need for life and godliness, he goes, because you've been given all that, take advantage of it and make every effort to add to your faith this virtue that he wants you to have. See, it's, it's this idea of we get to pursue these things. Do you understand that? It's, it's because, why, why should you pursue all these things? Because you can. And because you get to. I mean, when you became a believer, was it just because you didn't want to go to hell? Or was it because you saw that God offered a better life and this morality that he was offering and this way of living was better and you're saying, God, I want to repent. I want to turn from all that stuff and I want to live this way now. I mean, didn't you desire these things? Didn't, did, isn't, isn't that what the Holy Spirit put on us is this desire for, for virtue? 
and this desire for character. There's a huge, huge question. And it has to do with your attitude. Are you thinking in your mind, I get to change or I have to change? <coughs> in other words, is this what you want? You know, wow, the Holy Spirit came into me and I get to put off all this, these deeds of the flesh. Or are you here today going, oh man, asking those silly questions I've heard my whole life. Do I have to stop drinking? Do I have to forgive? Do I have to stop watching those movies? Do I have to? I mean, is God, I, God will still let me into heaven even if I leave my wife, right? God will still let me into heaven even though I still hate my parents, right? God will still let me into heaven even though I, I'm going to keep on with this addiction that I have, right? God will still let me into heaven even if I do this, right? See, those types of questions reveal a heart that is not about get to but have to. It reveals, a, a, it gets me to question, wait, so, so you don't actually want to be saved from the old you? You're actually hoping you can keep those things and still get heaven? Because the way I understand the Holy Spirit coming into a person is that he makes us a slave to righteousness. We have a new master in us that actually desires the things that are right and good. And then he changed our nature that we actually... And that doesn't mean we don't get off course. It doesn't mean we don't get temptation because we're still in this fallen world. And the flesh is still with us. But we have this new master that actually wants to live a righteous life. Isn't that you? And so whenever you blow it, you're like, oh, I didn't want to be that person. See, and, and the Bible says because you don't have to be that person anymore and you're given a new nature and now you, you get to and you've got everything you need to live this godly life. So go for it. Go for it. And, and, and now make every effort because you get to. I mean, don't you hate it when someone wastes potential? It, you know, uh, it, it was like my... <clears throat> my kid that wanted to quit piano, you know, a couple of years ago. And I go, oh, no, no way. No way. I'm not letting you. I'm not letting you. I'm not letting you waste that gift. You know why? Because as a dad, you know, when you see your kids, you know, just an incredible athlete or whatever, and they just want to quit. And you're like, no, no, you're not quitting. Okay. You're going to regret quitting. You're going to regret quitting because you've been given this gift and you got to go for it. You got to go for it. Got to go for it. And then once they get going and they mature, they go, oh, thank you for not letting me quit. So I just went through a weird phase there. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad I didn't quit. Some of you guys are looking at your kids. See? Yeah. <laughs> it was all around the room. It was weird. It was all this. It, it's just this idea of that's, don't you understand? That's, that's the thrust of this passage. See, I have the potential to be an amazingly godly man. I have the potential of being such a virtuous, self-controlled, persevering, just knowledgeable person that just lives so holy, filled with so much love. And that's why the Bible says, because you have that potential now, because the Holy Spirit's in you, go after it 100%. Don't quit on these things. Make every effort towards it. That's what we want of our kids, right? When we see a gift in them, we're like, come on, go after it. You've been given something. And that's this idea here is God's given you his Holy Spirit. He's given you an ability to be, be so holy, so righteous, so virtuous. So don't believe the lies that you can't be this, you can't be that. Yeah, you took some wrong turns, but here's what the word of God is saying. Okay, now make every effort toward these things. It starts with faith. <clears throat> see this new nature you got to believe that god not only gives you this new desire to want righteousness but he gives you the power that enables you to achieve it isn't that cool it's it's not just this desire it's one thing to desire some people may desire righteousness before becoming a believer but they won't have the power to accomplish it and what he's saying is my divine nature has given you this you've taken of that divine nature my divine power has given you it to to you but you got to believe that 
It all starts with faith. You know, why, why even move on on the list if you don't have faith? Because if you don't have faith, then you don't believe that any of these things can be yours. And so you've got to believe that, yes, number one, God loves you. And for those of you who have walked away from your old life and say, God, I, I believe that Jesus died on that cross for all of my sins. I believe he rose from the grave I, I, and you've decided to follow him. He put a, a new nature in you. You've got to believe that. You've got to have faith, but you've you got to move on. You can't, you can't just have that faith. You've got to believe that. You've got to believe you have that power. But from that faith, he says you, you need to add to it and you need to add virtue. <laughs> this idea of virtue has to do with this, this moral excellence it's, it's in, your, in your actions, in your purity, in your thoughts. It's, it's, it's this purity. It's, it's the same thing when he refers to, uh, to God when he's called us to his own glory or virtue, he says in verse 3. He's called us to have the same glory or excellence that God has. So add to your faith. It's not enough for you just to say, oh, I believe. He says, no, add to that belief now this type of moral character. Have, have, you know, a lot of people say they believe, but your faith needs to be expressed in something concrete. And people ought to see this moral excellence in your life. And so he says, go after it. <coughs> Strive after it. This word also has to do with a strength and a courage that goes with it. Is virtuous a word that would be used to describe you? And are you going hard after it? Are you making every effort towards this? It's an interesting thing because we know that it's God that works in us, right? And it's his power. But at the same time, there's the command, make every effort. So there's something I do also. You know, remember that, that illustration I used way back when I brought that treadmill up here, you know, and, and, you know, just to help us understand the Holy Spirit. It's when you've been given this gift of this treadmill, you can't take it back a month later and go, I didn't lose any weight. Because the salesman will say, well, did you get on it? <laughs> you, you know, oh, I didn't know that. It's, it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. It's this idea of, yes, we've been given this tremendous gift and this power. But there's also this idea where he says, you know, make every effort towards these things. Make every effort to add to, to that faith that you have. It's great that you believe. And now add to it virtue. Work hard at your moral excellence knowing that it's God that's working through you to accomplish these things. <clears throat> and then it says to add to your virtue, knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. How are you doing with your knowledge? Have you been working harder and harder to understand God, understanding the truth about God? Understanding the Word of God. How are you doing with your study in the Word of God? We've been talking about this a lot, about how we've been so busy and scattered and doing these different things and making effort towards keeping up with everyone and, and giving little shallow answers to everyone and making sure everyone hears your opinion and, and Facebooking and tweeting what you believe and everything to the world. We've made a lot of effort towards that. But how much effort have you made towards knowing God better? How much effort have you made toward knowing the word of God better? Some of you guys have been believers for years and years and years. And the only verse you can quote is John 3.16. Have you made every effort at adding to your virtue? Maybe you are living a virtuous life. Maybe you are living that guy life. Are you adding to it knowledge? Start making effort towards that. And it's more than just facts. This knowledge has to do with an internalization of those facts because we all know people who know a lot about the scriptures and then we look at their lives and it's obvious that they haven't internalized those things, but they can quote it. It has to do with a wisdom of internalizing. It's about growing in this knowledge and wisdom that actually directs us in life. <clears throat> then he says to add to your knowledge, self-control. <laughs> Self-control has to do with the person who, who is able to master his sensual desires. And, and sometimes when we talk about self-control, we just talk about the extremes. But you've got to understand this word. It, it's, it's, it's about it's just the things in natural life and being moderate about those desires. 
you understand that? We all have natural desires. And those aren't all bad. It's about being able to control them and being moderate in them. I desire eating. Okay? That's normal. That's the way God made me. It's, it, it, it's okay. I, I, but but, but do, I, do I show self-control in that? We have sexual desires. It's normal. It's God-given. But are you moderate in that? Are you in control of those urges, those desires? I like to sleep. Don't you love to sleep? But are you in control of that and monitoring how, how much you sleep? Do you really need that much sleep? It'd be nice to see the sun every once in a while. <clears throat> I like to play. That is one of my weaknesses. Oh, I love to play. I love to just laugh and play. I just play every day. It's a desire. But how are you doing in moderation? You need clothes to stay warm, but how, how many clothes do you need? It's a self-control. You, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, <clears throat> I think this is a weakness. Many of us would say, I've got way too much. But what are you going to do this week? Go buy more. Why? Because we lack self-control. It's not... We desire all these things. You see, and, and we want to go to the extreme. Well, I'm not doing this. This is... I know, but just make every effort towards self-control. See, this was one of the parts where I messed up in my life was you get to this point, you start comparing yourselves to other people and your character. And you're going, well, you know, for me, I'm going, well, I'm a lot better than you guys. So, you, you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it's that idea of, of where you almost feel like, you know what, I'm good enough in this area rather than making every effort towards this virtue that God has. And getting there to where, wow, I totally am content in these areas. I really do have self-control in all these areas. How are you doing in the area of self-control? Are you making efforts? Are you making strides? Are you diligent toward this? Because we can be diligent toward a lot of things and, and neglect our character. This next one's tough. <coughs> because he, he, he tells us to add to our self-control this idea of steadfastness steadfastness is a, a word for patience steadfastness is the word for when you have a weight on you and you just keep holding it up it's like holding up under that weight he says, you know, we need to be, because that, it's this endurance. Like, I'm going to hold it up longer. I'm going to hold it up longer. I'm going to hold it up. See, that's the steadfastness. And what we want to do is say, God, get rid of that weight. Right? Because then I can just relax. And everything would be easy. But this idea of steadfastness, you don't become steadfast. You don't persevere unless there's some weight on you. And there's some pressure on you. And... And you're going to feel like quitting. It's going to get more and more difficult. You're going to feel like quitting and you want to collapse. And so most of us, let's be honest, we pray and say, God, get rid of that weight. Because we're not so concerned about developing steadfastness. When's the last time? Have you ever, think about this, have you ever in your life asked God to make your life a little more difficult so that you could develop steadfastness. Have you ever in your life thought to yourself, you know what, I'm kind of weak. Every little trial comes my way and I fall apart. And you say, God, I want to work on that because I want to become this man or woman who is steadfast. So keep it coming. <laughs> you see, it's, it's comical. But really, I mean, you think about it, it because we care about our comfort far more than we care about our character. But that's not God's desire. Okay, think about this. I've used this many, many times. But think about this. 2010 is coming up, right? It's, it's right around the corner. We've got, we got a little month and a half to prepare for it. Let's say Jesus came in the room today and said, 2010 is coming. As you guys walk out today, I'm going to give you an option. Everyone has an option of plan A or plan B. For 2010. 
In 2010, here's your, here's your choice you get to make today. 2010, I can make it a very easy and comfortable year for you. Everything's going to go your way. You want, you, you want a great marriage? It'll be there. You, you're not married? You want a perfect mate? She's coming. Uh, you, you, you want uh, you know, a new job where you make three times as much as last year? You'll get it. You want no one in your family to get sick, and you won't get sick. In fact, you'll end up with a six-pack. Everything, just supernaturally. <laughs> you know, it's just, <clears throat> it's all going to be there. Now, at the end of the year, you're not going to be any stronger than you were in 09. You're not going to be any closer to me. We're not going to be any more intimate, but it will have been a fun year. Or I'll give you plan B. Plan B. <laughs> 2010, I'm going to have you go through some hardships. And it's not going to be an easy year. But during those times, you and I are going to get so close. You're going to get so close to me. I mean, you, we're going to, you're going to experience me like never before. And at the end of the year, you're going to be this man or woman that is just so far beyond who you are today. This steadfast is this strength you've never had. And I'll get you through it. But it'll be tough. And so you're walking out the door and Jesus greets you. And he goes, what do you want? Plan A, plan B. To be honest, what are you going to choose? Think that through. See, I found myself frustrated at hardship lately. As though something were going wrong. See, but if I were, the, the reason why I was so frustrated was because I wasn't thinking about my character. Most days I wake up and I don't think about my character and wanting to be a certain type of man. I just want to be happy. I just want all the problems to go away. What do you want for yourself? Because I'll tell you what God wants. He wants you to be Holy. He wants you to be the steadfast person. <coughs> you see, instead of being frustrated at hardship, if I was really concerned about my character, then I could obey James 1 that says, consider it all joy when you encounter these trials. Because you're going, oh, good, trials are here. <laughs> and I've been concerned about my steadfastness, so here's an opportunity to get stronger. I, I haven't pulled that one off yet. So, but it, it, it's just God re, recalculating, going, Francis, you've been frustrated at so many things. Don't you understand? I've been trying to change you and make you stronger and turn you into this man that you want to be, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. All right. Keep them coming. That's a hard prayer. That's a hard, hard prayer. And as we talk about persevering, understand, I'm not going to get through this passage today. So you're thinking, oh man, he's just there and we're never going to get through verse 11. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep plugging away. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll finish next week. <coughs> but let's, let's continue through these character qualities. Next, he, he says, you know, add to it godliness. I, godliness. This, this word has to do with like a reverence, a respect toward God, kind of a, a religious, more of a piety. It's this idea of, um, and, and understand, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list of all the character qualities. It's just a general, you know, it's just it's this principle of, you know, all these things are the things we ought to be striving for. It's not exhaustive. It's not every single one, and it doesn't have to be in this order. It's just saying in general, do you, do you want to be a godly person? Do you want to be a persevering person? Do you want to be a self-controlled person do you want to be a loving person don't you want to so go after go after these things you've been given the ability to become this person that has all of these qualities it's about the fruit of the holy spirit are all of these qualities not one of them all of them go after don't you want to be this awesome person that, that, that that's godly that's steadfast that's self-controlled that's knowledgeable that's virtuous and then and, and the next one he says brotherly affection or brotherly affection is this idea of, of tender affection towards your spiritual family. This brotherly affection that we ought to have. The word is Philadelphia. You know, that's where we get the city of brotherly love, which is funny that it's Philadelphia. But it's, it's this idea of, of, this word is just, 
you know, we're a family in here. Okay? Do, 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 do you get that? And he wants us to have this tender affection for one another, like a true, true family member. To long for that. That's why a lot of times we, we push for, man, you've got family members on your own block, in your own neighborhood, and, and God wants this brotherly affection amidst you. That, yeah, you may have nothing in common with them other than Jesus Christ and your salvation, your desire to live a holy life and his mission. But on a fleshly level, you may I never hang out with that guy. And God says, but don't you want to have this brotherly affection with them? Because that's God's desire, is that you work through those relationships, you stick with them, and you, you have this tenderness toward them. In 1 John 4, 20, he says, you can't say that you love God and you hate your brother. That doesn't make any sense. There ought to be this brotherly affection. You know, someone in our church uh, was asked to go to another religion um, and attend their service. And so she told this group of people, okay, I'll go to yours, but you got to come to mine. And, uh, and, and I don't advise that for everyone, but for those who are strong and for this person uh, she was, I go, man, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And I said, so what was it like, you know, going to this other place? And what was the difference between the two religions? And she goes, well, the message here was better, of course. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the truth. But, uh, but they were so much friendlier. It's like you walked in and it's like everyone knew each other. And asked, how are you doing? How are you doing? And they just overwhelmed me. I mean, she's, you know, people here were friendly to my friends, but it was just high type of thing. Whereas there was family. And, I, I, and that hurts to hear, doesn't it? And at the same time, we also know it's true. And, and so understand when we, we, I know... I know we've made some mistakes as leaders and maybe going overboard and pushing, 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 like love each other, get to know each other, spend time with each other and almost a forcing thing. But do you understand our heart behind it? That we just go, this isn't right. I can't do this anymore. God wants a brotherly affection amongst us and, and we've got to somehow create it. And it's hard to turn a ship this big and say, okay, everyone come next Sunday. We're going to love on each other. It just doesn't, it's not an overnight thing. But we're just working and working and striving after it because it's what God wants. And he wants us to be diligent in this area. Add to your brotherly affection, love. <clears throat> Understand this love that he talks about. And it's the last one that he mentions. And he says this love is... Uh, it's a God love. It's an agape love. It's, you know, God is love, right? It's, it's, it's who he is. But understand his love is a subjective love, not an objective one. It's, it's not one that's based upon the object of his love and what they do for him. Oh, they love me. I'll love them in return. It's just, no, I myself am love. And so I do nothing but love. I, I love not because of who you are. I love in spite of who you are. Is, is, is that what you're known for? Don't you want to be that person, though? Where people hate you, spit on you, curse you, and you can just love them in return? Isn't that what we signed up for? I want to be like Jesus. Go ahead and nail me to a cross, and I'll still love you. And say, forgive them. They know not what they do. How are you doing on that? Because <clears throat> the Bible says... Verse 8, and I'll just close with this, and we'll, we'll pick it up next week. See what time it is. <clears throat> if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, as we look at those qualities, are they increasing in your life? Because it's, it's, it's not a question of are you better than other people. The question is, is are they increasing? 
Are you more loving than you were a few months ago? Do you have more self-control than you had a few months? It doesn't matter what level you're at. The question is, is are they increasing? Are they abounding? Do you just see more and more and more of it? Because that's what's going to keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. And isn't that what we are? I mean, no one wants to live a pointless life, right? You just want to take up space and survive? Or don't you want to know that you did something here on this earth? And he says, well, if these character qualities are in you and they're increasing, you know what? It'll keep you. That's, that's your promise. That's guard, your guard from being ineffective. Now, when I asked you that question earlier, what do you work hardest at? Some would say your jobs. Some would say at raising your kids. Some would say maybe at ministering to other people and trying to change them. Even change your own spouse. Some of you, maybe it's toward relationships and getting relationships. (coughs) But let me give you this one last thought. Let me just throw this out. Let's take parenting. Some of you parents, you take this so seriously. And that's awesome. You don't see being a mom or a dad as, as your secondary role or just, you know, a little side thing you got to do. You see it as a responsibility before the Lord, and that's great. And so you work hard at teaching your kids by putting them in, in programs, giving them rules, putting them in wh- whatever school you, you think is best for them. All those things are good. But the greatest thing you can do for your kids is pursue your own character. It really is. This whole, hey, I want you to obey me so you don't end up like me. (laughs) That's been our go-to line and it's never really worked. The best thing is for you to choose to pursue moral excellence yourself. Because so much of what they learn is caught and not taught. We've heard that before. For them to see a life that's been changed and for them to go, I want that, rather than say, I'll do all the right things because I don't want to be like my parents. It's not effective parenting. God's plan for parenting was always the same, Deuteronomy 6, that as you go along life, As you walk about your way, as your kids are lying down, you're just teaching them all along life's road. They're watching your life and seeing these character qualities, and you're teaching them the Word of God as they walk alongside of you. You're going, see, see how God's blessed. Look at His grace and peace in my life. See, Mom and Dad, and the grace and peace amidst us. This is what we want for you. That's been God's desire. And I understand some of you, you can't do that because you're... You're not in a relationship where both people want to follow after God. and <clears throat> So there's some recalculating that needs to be done there. But you as an individual, as a spirit-filled man or woman of God by yourself, it's amazing what God can do through you. And for them to see maybe even the difference of a person who understands the grace and peace of God and be in that home along with a person who doesn't have that. Be diligent in these things. Some of you, you're so focused on maybe it's a relationship. You want, you you know, we've seen it. The people that want a relationship so badly that they focus on finding the right person rather than being the right person. And that never works, does it? You just keep looking, looking, looking. You keep finding the right people. But they have no reason for wanting to be with you. Because you haven't focused on your own character. You find that person and go, well, why would I want to be with you? You haven't, you haven't worked on the character. See, what, what I'm saying is, what the scripture is saying is, God wants us to live a fruitful life and we, be, we become the people that he wants us to be. The other things will come into place. It'll happen. And, and if not, there's going to be a persevering, a steadfastness that he's going to create in you. I'm not saying you do this and everything's going to be easy. I'm saying, but at the end, you become the person you want to be. For me, I've noticed that even in ministry, even in good things like parenting and even in ministry, I've been too focused on 
fixing and making things happen. And God's saying, Francis, just, just walk with me. Just know me. Just become the man of God you were meant to be. Isn't that how everything happened anyways? Just get back on that path, recalculating, getting back and listening. And I hope you do the same in your life too. I'm going to have the worship team come up and <clears throat> we're going to give you some time for reflection. As the worship team plays, what we're going to do is we're going to throw some verses up on the screen that just talk about these qualities that we've been uh, talking about. And as you, as you read those, just take some time to meditate and to seek diligently these things. <coughs> and, 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 and don't forget that there's a truth that as we seek God, that these things will come to us. You know how you become like the people you hang out with a lot? As we know God more and more, and as we're closer and closer to him, you become more and more like him. That's why we so emphasize knowing God. These qualities are the qualities of God himself. And that's why he says, I want you to become like me. Make every effort to become like me. I saved you to become like me. I made you ambassadors of me. I want to look down and see me in you. That's why he wants these things. Because God's the ultimate good. And so as you look at these qualities, it's a time of repentance to say, God, Help me to make every effort toward these things. Fix this in me. Change me. Not my circumstances. Change me.